Well, today uh, we are hearing from Dr. Nicholas Rohner from the Stowers Institute for Medical Research in Kansas City, Kansas. And he's talking about metabolic adaptation, which has been a long topic of interest in evolutionary medicine and is also appropriate for uh, this month of November, National Diabetes Awareness Month. Uh, Dr. Sauer studied at the Max Planck Institute in Germany then at Harvard University for his postdoc, and he established his lab in Kansas City in 2015. And his interest, as you'll see, is on metabolic adaptation to extreme environments and how that informs us about metabolic disease. So Dr. Roder, take it away. Thank you so much for the introduction and the invitation. All right, so yeah, my lab, um, we're mainly using cavefish um, to study this, um, even though it, uh, we have uh, uh, broadened our portfolio a little bit in the very end, I'm just going to give you a flavor of um, some other systems that we're exploring, but still majority of the, uh, the, the lab is still using cavefish. And we're using cavefish as a system to study how animals adapt to periods of nutrient limitation or starvation. Obviously, this is an important question um, for generally for evolution, even our own evolutionary history. Um, that's why there's this Greek goddess of starvation, um, Lemos. So why are we using cavefish to, to study this? Well, that has to do with the unique environment that these fish are living in. Um, so it's a very um, biodiversity deprived environment. So for example, there are no other predators, cavefish are the top predators. So that's when you put your hand in, they will actually come to you because they completely lost fear. But what is also unique about this environment is that there's um, basically no food, right? There's no light, no plants, no photosynthesis. So that means there are no primary producers in these caves. That means the food has to come somehow from the outside. And what we think is happening, at least for some of the caves, they get flooded quite heavily in the rainy season. Um, and then the idea is food gets in, they eat a lot, they store excess energy as fat, and then starve for a very, very long time. And this has been um, very beautifully shown in a recent study where they looked at gut contents. Um, so here, this would be a cave, um, Sabinos, that gets flooded in the summer. And so you see here the frequency of empty guts basically increasing until the summer, until the rain, everybody has eaten. But there are other caves, like for example, this Pachon cave here, which do not get flooded. And so there basically cavefish are hungry all the time. So even within the system, we have different adaptation to different environments where we can study either adaptation to general nutrient limitation or adaptation to these feast and famine cycles. But the reason that we're using this particular cavefish species uh, called Astyanax mexicanus um, is because they come in two very different but very closely related forms. We have these cave adapted derived forms, the cavefish, um, and then we have the surface, the river, the ancestral form that we call the surface fish. And even though they look quite different, genetically, genomically, they're not. Their genomes are very similar. They even consider the same species, which means you can cross these together. You get fertile progeny, which means you can actually do genetics, can map trait differences using um, genetics. And most importantly, of course, we can actually keep them in the lab. We have them in the lab. Um, they breed in the lab. They are very similar to zebrafish. I mean, they're a little bit bigger, but other than that, uh, very similar to what we can do with zebrafish as well. Another nice advantage of the system is that we have repeated or parallelly evolved populations. You're going to hear about three in the talk, Molino, Tinaja, and Pachon. And they represent repeated experiments of evolution in nature, but often with a very similar outcome. So it's a great system to study what would happen if you re replay tape of life. Do you get the same result? Do you get a different result? Or you get the same result, but through different types of means? These are, of course, very important questions in evolution, usually very difficult to study, but something that we can readily address with this system. All right, so when, when we, even though we go there from time to time in the wild, what I'm going to show you today, most of it is actually in the lab. And so what happens if, we, if they are in the lab, if we feed them every day? Well, again, we notice that they become extremely starvation resistant. You can starve them for several months, probably years, and they will be fine. And they do this by overeating, so they're hyperphagic, and then they develop these obesity-like phenotypes with um, hypertrophic adipocytes, so enlarged fat cells. And especially this last part really caught our attention because we know from other 
systems, uh, other vertebrate systems that, that if you have too many of these very large um, uh, adipocytes, especially in the visceral fat, this can lead to inflammation. So the idea is if some of them become too big, they will burst, free fatty acids gets out, which is toxic to the tissue that attracts macrophages, then they go in, release pro-inflammatory cytokines that attracts further macrophages and so on. And if this vicious circle of inflammation stays on too long, can become chronic and lead to other health issues. So what about KFISH? Um, and just to give an idea about what I mean by hypertrophic adipocytes. So these are two sections through their visceral fat, same magnifications. These are really, really, really large cells in KFISH. So in principle, this should lead to inflammation. And when we quantify this, however, and it's actually very simple to quantify, you can basically just look what are called so-called crown-like structures, which are basically these dying cells that are surrounded by macrophages. You can easily see them on sections like here. And if we look for these, um, we were really surprised that even though they were present in surface fish, they were almost entirely absent in cave fish. So we were really wondering, are they maybe resistant to inflammation or what's going on there? And to study this, we, we then triggered inflammation in these fish. So um, using LPS injection, so LPS is an um, outer molecule, uh, outer membrane uh, molecule of bacteria, which is known to trigger inflammation. So we injected this into um, surface fish and cave fish. And then as a readout, we looked for one of these pro-inflammatory cytokines. So this is RNA scope for one of these pro-inflammatory cytokines, interleukin one beta. And you basically in surface fish, you see tons of cells um, expressing this after LPS, very few in cave fish. And so this was in the spleen, but if we look systemically and for other pro-inflammatory cytokines as well, this seems to be the trend. Um, the, so they're really starvation resistant. Um, to get at the mechanism, this is um, um, something um, that um, I don't have much time to go into detail, but basically we used a single cell analysis. We used two approaches, single cell RNA-seq, um, but also a new approach that we uh, developed that uh, takes advantage of the morphology of these cells. So immune cells have very different morphologies. So if you run them through a machine that is called an image stream, which basically is like a fax that takes a picture of every cell that runs through, that also allows you to cluster them. Um, and again, if you're interested, this has been published. Um, but basically, both of these gave us very similar results. Um, and just to give you the gist of it, what we found is there seems to be this immune system shift in KFISH between the innate immunity, which is the first line of response, also the cells like macrophages that actually trigger inflammation, and then um, the, the adaptive immunity. Um, and uh, what we find is that there are fewer cells, especially macrophages, of the innate immunity in cavefish, but more of certain um, T cells population, especially some that are also known to be anti-inflammatory. So we think that this is at least some of the some of the mechanisms underlying um, this this inflammation resistance. But we're really interested in further studying this. All right, what we also found in the lab is that these cavefish are um, insulin resistant, glucose intolerant, and hyperglycemic. So basically, like diabetes, um, high blood sugar. Um, but it's not diabetes, um, at least it's not a disease in these cave fish. So they live very long and healthy lives, uh, maybe even longer than, than surface fish, more than 15 years. And even if you look for specific markers of the disease, like this advanced glycated end product, these are not elevated in cave fish, um, at least not in Tinaha and Pachon. So they are elevated in, in Molino, and we don't know why, what's going on there. They also live as long as, as the other fish. Um, but at least in Tinaha and Pachon, we're really interested in how you can, uh, how can you can potentially prevent the formation of these advanced glycated end products because they're not only a marker, they're actually also causing the disease. And so um, to study a little bit more what's the, uh, what the molecular mechanism underlying this is, so here we found even the mutation that is responsible for this. So there's a mutation in the insulin receptor in cave fish. Um, so in, in a position that is highly conserved, so all vertebrates, human surface fish, all other vertebrates, even some invertebrates like Drosophila have a proline at this position. Two cave fish populations, again, the Tinaha and Pachon, they have a leucine. Uh, Molino has also the, the ancestral version. But interestingly enough, in humans, if you have a leucine at this position, you would be considered severely diabetic. So there are a few cases of severe insulin resistance that have the exact same mutation at exact same position than cave fish. And, uh, um, and they are insulin resistant. And so to study this, we um, actually used um, the zebrafish as a model and we generated basically like a cave zebrafish. So we, we changed that amino acid, that proline in zebrafish, which they also have, that's also conserved, to a leucine like we see in cavefish using homologous recombination and CRISPR. 
And then we asked, are they also insulin resistant? And indeed they are. Um, but what we also noticed is that they are a little bit bigger than um, the wild type. And so when we quantified this, we think that this is potentially helping them to gain weight. And this is what we're also seeing in these, in these um, cavefish. So the idea is that potentially if their muscle is insulin resistant, they can use this glucose in the liver to make um, more fat. But again, this is just a hypothesis. We're just trying to um, study really what's the mechanism there. But what we noticed is that actually having this mutation is giving them an advantage also in, in longevity. So the, the, um, heterozyg uh, the, the heterozygous, yes, and the homozygous mutants both live significantly longer than um, the wild type siblings, at least in zebrafish. But again, this is something that you want to study in zebrafish and not in cavefish, which live 15 years. But um, this is something that at least still takes a long time in zebrafish, but at least something you can do in zebrafish. All right, so we found a couple of um, um, coding mutations um, in, in several genes, but obviously these are very complex phenotypes and we know that um, cis-regulatory mutations are playing major roles in evolution as well. So we really wanted to study this in, in a little bit more detail as well. But of course, it's much, much harder to study cis-regulatory uh, mutations. Mm -hmm. um, you know, cannot just go on ensemble and look where the gene is um, um, and look for mutations. You really have to generate your own map of cis-regulatory elements. And so this is work of a postdoc in a lab, um, Jaya Krishnan. And so she used a couple of approaches. So we used, um, uh, we focused on the adult liver as the metabolically active organ in, 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 in vertebrates, most metabolically uh, active organ. Um, and she used a couple of approaches. So we used RNA-seq, but then we combined it with ATAC-seq, which looks at regions of open chromatin, which are often associated with cis elements, and also CHIP-seq, which is a little bit more specific for um, looking for certain histone modifications that are also associated with either being a promoter or enhancer or repressor. And so when, when we did this, um, obviously you get a lot. Um, you, we, this is just the ATEC seq data. We got over 80,000 uh, putative, so 80, over 80,000 peaks, which are basically putative cis elements. Um, but so the first thing that you can do now with the system is you can compare them between surface and cave. And so when we do this, we see the majority of them are the same, which is not too surprising. They're still the same species, um, but at least that's also kind of a quality control um, that it worked, but then there's some that are unique. And these are the ones that we're probably interested in. When we do the same thing with another parallelly evolved um, population, Tinaha, we see very similar result, majority the same, some are unique. And so what we did next was then to compare what's, what's the overlap between Pachan and Tinaha. And there again, I think this was kind of surprising. Um, I mean, maybe not in retrospect, but at that point, was that again, the majority of them are the same. So similar to some of the phenotypes like eye loss or pigmentation loss, we see this convergence on the cis um, level as well. So there seems to be using the same um, cis networks to get to these phenotypes, which is kind of interesting. Okay, but still 80,000, how do we test these? Um, we are currently um, um, using massive parallel report assays to go through thousands of them. Um, but for this um, publication, we basically um, just used um, uh, uh, a promoter essay, a, a reporter essay um, to test a few of them. Um, so we tested 25 um, by cloning them in front of a minimal promoter, which would only drive um, um, expression of this reporter gene if this element has some enhancer function. function. And then we used um, zebrafish liver cell lines and human liver cell lines to study this. And so this is the, the results of the zebrafish liver cell lines. And uh, there are a couple of things that you can see here. So first of all, the majority of the 25 that we tested drive expression above baseline. So above just the vector, which would be this line here. Some of them don't, but at least most of them have some enhancing function. But then there are some that are unique, uh, that are different between if you test either the cavefish sequence or the surface fish sequence. And these are the ones that we're really interested in. We did the same thing with human cell lines. There you see you're even losing um, more information. So not all of them work anymore. So the further you go, evolutionary speaking, um, uh, you lose, um, this is not very useful anymore. And so, but even zebrafish um, is 150 million years um, away from uh, cavefish. So the zebrafish liver cell lines may also not be the best one. So we recently developed our own um, cavefish liver cell line, which we can repeat this experiment and it may be even more informative. 
But just for this study, we focused on one that is actually conserved between cavefish and uh, uh, between uh, uh, zebrafish liver cell lines and the human liver cell lines, and that is different between the cavefish and the surface fish sequence. And that is one that is, so it's a cis-regulatory element or a putative cis-regulatory element that lies in this intron of this gene here, 4-hydroxyphenol pyruvic acid dioxygenase, HPDB. I'm going to talk about that function of the gene later. And this gene is actually also the most differentially expressed uh, in our data set. So it's highly expressed in, uh, in cave fish livers. It's very little expressed in surface fish livers. And which is in line with the, the peaks that we are seeing. So it's basically more open in, in cave. Um, and also these other histone modifications are more active in, in, in cave fish. But of course, this is just a correlation, right? I mean, it could be, we don't even know if this expression difference that we see here is controlled by something in cis. It could be controlled by something in trans as well. But we can actually study this um, using a very simple um, um, approach and taking advantage of the fact that you can cross the cave fish and the surface fish together. Because when we do this, um, and then what we look is you basically take a SNP that is different between the surface and the cave fish sequence um, in this gene, some non-coding SNP, like let's say an A in surface, a C in cave fish. And then in the F1s, if you look on the DNA, obviously you're gonna get both, right? And if you take a PCR and uh, sequence the DNA, you of course gonna get uh, both alleles. But then in the RNA, what we found is we only find the cave allele being expressed. And that's a very strong indication that this is indeed something that is controlling, that is controlled in cis, because if it would be controlled by a transcription factor, let's say, that would affect on both alleles the same. It may be different, but it would not be just favoring one allele of the other one. So at least we know it is something nearby this gene that is um, um, uh, responsible for this expression difference. So we looked at this particular sequence and we found indeed that there's a mutation, a deletion in this sequence in the cave fish that is removing a predicted transcription factor binding site um, for IRF2. So IRF2 is a, a repressor element. So that would make sense. If you lose that repression, you get this upregulation. Um, we tested this using a gel shift assay um, where you basically, you take that um, sequence, you radioactive label it, and then you put the transcription factor. We used, in this case, the human transcription factor, um, just the protein, you can buy it. Um, um, and then you just throw it on top of it. And if it binds, you should get this gel shift, um, the shift in, in your gel. And so this is the, these are the results. You basically just have to look at lane one and two. So one is without the transcription factor, two is with, and you see this gel shift happening. Um, these are just some other controls. Um, and this is no longer the case if you use the cave sequence. So indeed, there is some evidence that, that this sequence at least can bind this transcription factor and, and has lost this ability in cave fish. We tested this uh, using our uh, promoter assay finally, so uh, to see if we can rescue this or mimic this. So um, this is these are the results that I showed you before, just with the sequence in front of the minimal promoter cloned into zebrafish liver cell lines. Um, and then if we delete this from the surface fish sequence, we get a rescue basically, or we, no, not a rescue. We get the same phenotype like we see in, 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 in cave fish. And if we put it back into cave fish, um, we do get actually indeed a rescue. All right, so just very briefly, what is the role of this gene? Um, so this gene is here is the first rate limiting step of this pathway that turns tyrosine into um, energy basically into ATP. But tyrosine can be used for many things, including melanin and uh, also dopamine. And it's been already argued um, almost 10 years ago by um, Bill Jeffrey's lab that because cavefish don't have uh, melanin anymore, but they do have a lot of dopamine in their brain, maybe they're using that tyrosine instead of making it into melanin, turning it into dopamine in the brain, <laughs> kind of like an evolutionary trade-off. Um, and basically our finding is just adding more evidence to that that could be the case in the liver. They're maybe rather using it to, to, to make um, energy. Of course, we don't really know if that little bit of tyrosine would make a big difference, um, but at least if we look at all other genes in this pathway, um, they are all um, upregulated as well. All the other rate limiting steps are upregulated in this um, pathway as well. So it's at least quite active in fish, this pathway. All right, so um, just to sum up, um, this part, um, I, I, I mean, so we're generally getting a few a good understanding now of 
the general strategies and also some of the mutations that are underlying this um, starvation resistance or fat gain, fat gain, basically. I think you can use these two inter interchangeably in the system. And so we, I showed you that cavefish um, eat more. Um, and we found this is due to a mutation in a gene called MC4R, which is a gene that is controlling appetite. It's blocking appetite, so it's mutated in cavefish. It's actually a gene that is also um, responsible for a lot of um, obesity um, um, cases in human as well. Um, another group found that cavefish have better gut absorption, so their, their amount that the food stays in the gut is longer, time that it stays in the gut is longer, and so basically potentially that allows them to get more fat out of the food. As I mentioned, we think that this insulin resistance um, is helping them to turn um, glucose rather into fat than into um, energy. I haven't had, I don't have time to talk about this. Um, we also found recently that cavefish have a very good at a process, which is called uh, de novo lipogenesis, which is a process that allows you to take sugar and proteins and turn them into, um, into uh, fat. And cavefish have an almost 1000 fold um, increased ability of doing this in part due to a mutation in, in PER2, which is a circadian rhythm gene, but I'm not gonna go into detail here. I showed you this um, cis regulatory mutation. Um, and um, we also think that this inflammation resistance, and we also found some increased antioxidants, that this is kind of an indirect way that allows them to accumulate all this without having inflammation. So it's pointing also in this direction, even though it's more of an indirect uh, event. And so for the last few minutes, I want to um, talk about something different, kind of rather than making fat, maybe you want to uh, uh, use up less of your fat, being more thrifty. Um, and so this is work that is, is published, but it's is not fully peer reviewed yet. So I, I thought I'm ending with something that is a little bit um, um, novel. And again, it has to do with the environment that these fish are living in. Um, and uh, so this is a, a movie of the surface fish streams. Um, it's beautiful there, but it's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of predators. There are um, currents that the fish have to swim against. Um, while in caves, yeah, they just basically, at least during the, rain, the, during the dry season, when we go there, they're just scrolling around and they are not very fast swimmers, which, are, which is basically, I mean, they don't have to, right? There's no, no, no predators, no um, current. Um, so this should be in principle be more, um, that's what takes up less energy um, um, than the fast movements. So what about in the lab? Um, so we quantified this in a lab, so they still have the same um, behavior in the lab, even though we keep them on the same system with the same water flow. Um, so cavefish will basically like, they kind of constantly swimming around, but very, very slowly. And surface fish are still for a lot of time and then very, very quickly uh, move. And so this burst velocity is, is much higher in surface fish. And that's really what takes um, uh, muscle mass. So when we looked at muscle, um, indeed, we found that cavefish muscles are very much reduced. And again, we think that is helping them to increase um, fat. So all the things that you see here up in, in white um, is, is fat, adipose tissue. Um, but generally, the muscle mass is significantly decreased in, in cavefish. And uh, not only muscle mass, but actually also uh, muscle function. So this is um, a work in collaboration with David Hoffman at Wiener University where they have an apparatus that allows you to measure muscle strength. And uh, what they found, this is one of the parameters they looked at, what they found is that they have this decreased maximal shorting velocity, which is basically decreased uh, muscle uh, strength. So cavefish have fewer muscles and weaker muscles. But what was surprising then was if when we put them into a the swim tunnel um, and tested them in an, in an um, uh, swim test, and basically what we did there, it's an endurance test. So you um, increase um, speed every five minutes. So you let them swim for five minutes and you increase speed until, it's, and you do this until they get fatigued. And so this took about 30 minutes, 35 minutes before they get fatigued. And then you measure the maximum velocity. And there we were really surprised that cavefish can actually keep up pretty well with the surface fish. Um, and so we, we were wondering how is that possible? And we looked a little bit closer into the muscle and we found that their muscle are actually full of glycogen. Um, and uh, so this black, these black things here in between um, the stripes. 
And to get at some of the mechanistic uh, basis underlying this, we, we used some phosphoproteomics analysis and uh, we found several proteins, many proteins being overphosphorylated in, in KFISH, but one really caught our attention, which is this PGM1, um, because it had several um, phosphorylation sites that were overphosphorylated in, in KFISH. And it is actually a very interesting gene because it sits here in the deciding phase, either if you turn glucose into glycolysis or uh, so basically into energy, or you store it short term as glycogen. And it has been already shown that this particular um, phosphorylation site here, serine 117, is known that if this is, is known in, in its activation, so if this is activated, if this is phosphorylated, that means that gene is supposed to be more active. But the other ones were not uh, known, so we tested this. Sorry. Uh, the other ones were not known, so we tested this uh, in cell lines. Um, we introduced or we mutated um, that gene in a cell line um, by swapping uh, the, the threonine to an alanine, so it cannot longer get um, phosphorylated. And then we tested it in a seahorse, and the mutant cell line basically has more glycolysis than the wild type, meaning that this gene is basically less active and will not turn it into um, glycogen, um, the glucose, but rather turns it into glycolysis. Um, and finally, we also looked in, in, in vivo um, and we used uh, the muscles for uh, enzyme tests to see if the enzyme is, if this enzyme is more active in um, KFISH and indeed it is much more active than in surface fish. All right, so basically we're starting to get a good idea about the different um, mechanisms that are allowing KFISH to be starvation resistant. But we, there's still a lot to, that we need to learn. I mean, we haven't looked at eight, eight, uh, and we haven't looked at um, uh, mitochondria yet. We haven't looked very carefully in circadian rhythm, aging. There are many, many things that that could play a role here. And so, just very briefly, I want to give you a flavor of uh, what we are doing now, also in the lab. Um, so we have a um, have a very, very talented uh, postdoc in the lab, Jasmine Camacho. She's a Hannah Gray Fellow. Um, together with an extremely talented uh, undergrad as well, Andrea Bernal. And what they're interested in is to look at um, bats, but looking at nectar bats, because basically what nectar bats are doing is they're just eating nothing else than sugar, right? Just sugar water is all they eat all day long. And uh, that shouldn't be very healthy. Um, and indeed, if we look into um, sugar, uh, blood sugar levels, so this is work they have done in the field. So this is field work. Um, they found that they have um, blood sugar levels that are more than 700, 700 something, 750 almost uh, milligrams per deciliter, which is which is really breaking the record so far of every uh, mammal that has been uh, tested for this. I mean, there's been some work um, in, in the lab on, on these bats as well, but they never reached this high level um, that we could find in the field. And this is indeed something that would usually lead to um, at least some diabetic coma in, in most other mammals. So how are they doing this um, is something that we're really interested in. So we're using a couple of omics approaches uh, like metabolomics um, on these samples to get at least some of the idea. I mean, of course, it's not a, a model system. We can't really have them in a the lab, um, but at least maybe we get some idea of what's going on there. Um, all right. And with that, I want to thank uh, many people, especially the people in my lab. Um, this is uh, uh, them on Halloween a couple of weeks ago, they surprised me by dressing all up like me, which is very easy to predict because I wear everything, um, everything, uh, every day the same thing. Uh, but it was very funny. So they're really, really cool. And uh, um, Star Wars Institute's fan fantastic resources. We have fantastic collaborators on KFISH. It's a very nice community um, and uh, other funding sources. And with that, I'm uh, happy to take uh, questions and start the discussion. Great, thank you, Nicholas. That was great. Uh, I'm gonna ask you to uh, stop the screen share just so we can have uh, everyone up on the main screen. And um, yeah, it looks like we have one question in the chat already. Uh, Ed, would you like to uh, ask your question? Uh, okay, uh, I was wondering if the cave fish have a uh, reduced variety of pathogens and a reduced number of infections, which if that were the case, that would explain the reduced need for inflammation and the um, reduced need for uh, a mm -hmm. strong innate immunity. Yes, absolutely. That's that's exactly what, what our hypothesis was. And it also kind of makes sense in terms of if it's a biodiversity deprived environment, 
there should be fewer parasites also because many parasites, they need some intermediate host. There may be a bird involved. All these things cannot really happen in the cave. Um, but it's never been tested. So when we went, actually, we went there and we tested, um, we, um, we, we collected um, 25 surface fish and 25 cave fish, and we carefully um, looked at their um, parasite load. I mean, we only looked at macro parasites, so we don't know anything about bacteria or viruses, but just by the ones that we could easily distinguish um, uh, or just see on the uh, uh, microscope, we found that 80% of surface fish had at least one parasite. Um, many had up to five. Um, and in cave fish, in all the samples that we looked, we didn't find a single one, not even a single one. So of course this is N of one. We don't know what happens during the rainy season, something like that when they come in or so. But yes, we definitely think that this is playing a major role of why they don't need an innate immune system as much as they, as maybe if they would be outside. Um, but we don't, I mean, this is just one hypothesis and there could be other reasons as well, but this is something that we're very interested in, in studying. So what would happen if you now infect them with, so will they be more susceptible to a parasite or not? Um, so that's something we're trying to establish um, also, uh, but yeah. And Nicholas, I had the same question. Maybe I could just ask a little bit of a follow-up. Um, is it, you were making the point that there's a shift toward the adaptive immune system. Is it that the um, activity of the adaptive immune system is actually higher uh, compared to the surface fish? Or is it just that the innate immune system is downregulated in some way? So it's a relative difference. Can you tell uh, from your results which one is? It's is the case? definitely a relative difference. Um, so we definitely see fewer innate, but we see even within the adaptive, we see specific populations upregulated and especially certain T cell populations being upregulated. And one of these, there's not much known other than they are supposed to be anti-inflammatory, but that's the only thing that we found from the literature. I mean, I'm not an immunologist. Um, I don't know uh, a lot about it, but this is what we found. Um, but we found, I mean, there's there's a lot of information in the paper um, that so the postdoc who is um, who is working on this and took this now with him to start his own lab. Um, he is a comparative um, um, immunologist. And uh, so he found even more cool things that, that I'm not uh, really don't know exactly what, what they mean. But generally what we found is a lot of um, uh, much fewer of the uh, macrophages and neutrophils and increased number of certain T cell populations. But generally it's more like really just a, a, a general shift. So I, we, don't, we didn't see more evidence for more B cells or something like other T cells. Which you could also imagine, right? I mean, you could think, okay, they may have fewer parasites, but they no fewer parasite diversity, but they may have more of a specific parasite. So therefore, it would be good to have some memory to it. But but um, we haven't seen that specifically. But again, there's still a lot of work that 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 needs to be done to fully understand that. And just one more quick follow up. Um, it wasn't clear to me if that was in one of those um, cave fish populations or in all three. Was there convergence in this, uh, you know, adapt this uh, this phenotype uh, shift uh, in the towards the adaptive immune system? Yeah. So um, the parasite work we only did in one cave, in the Pachon cave, the one that does not get flooded. However, the um, signature that we saw was similar between Pachon and Tinaha. So they both are um, inflammation resistant. They're both um, having fewer of the uh, innate immune system cells, but it was a little less um, striking in, in, in Tinaha than it was in Pachon. So it was particularly strong, um, the effect in, in Pachon. And we haven't looked at Molino, for example. We don't know what, what in Molino looks like. All right, thank you. Uh, Kaylin, would you like to ask your question? Good to see you. Yeah, thank, thanks. Uh, this is such fascinating work. I'm, I'm really glad I was able to make it today. Um, so I have two questions. The first one is sort of more of a broad, like uh, naturalistic question. And then the second one might be uh, a little more about the, the sort of intermittent fasting component. Mm -hmm. So the first question is, um, if you see uh, basically differences in reproduction between the cave fish and the surface fish or between those populations that might um, be somehow related to those feeding behaviors. Mm -hmm. And then the second question um, is if, so these fish obviously have, are blind, they're in the dark all the time. 
Um, there's a lot of research that suggests that maybe in some cases the timing of feeding, so the circadian rhythm mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, is important for fasting. Do they show circadian rhythms? Obviously, maybe the food isn't coming in in any way that is predictable in that sense, but do they show circadian rhythms? And is there mm -hmm. anything interesting in, uh, that you might want to mm -hmm. talk about in that, in that yeah, area? Yeah, no, I mean, I could talk for both of these topics for a long time, um, but I'm going to try to limit it very short. So for reproduction, generally, cave animals are believed to have fewer progeny, but invest more in their progeny. So generally the eggs are bigger there's more yolk and things like that um that's true for throughout for all cave animals um we do see the same thing but maybe not as striking that you may think of so um the eggs are just a teeny tiny bit bigger um and they still get hundreds and surface fish maybe have thousands but it's i mean it's you have maybe 300 versus 800 eggs or something like that in a batch but it's really dependent on fish it's really depending on size and many other factors so it's nothing really super dramatic um but yes there is the trend bigger eggs more yolk less um, um eggs for for cave fish so cadem rhythm is um, um very interesting and um, we are actively studying it um so generally so there, there's another cave fish population, which is, is, is been used a lot to study circadian rhythm. Um, and that's a Somalian cave fish population. They are about a million years old in their cave. So the separation between the surface and the cave, even though they don't know what the surface is, the surface is extinct by now. Um, but they've been estimated to be a million years in the caves. Ours are estimated to be a hundred thousand years in the cave, 150, something like that. So there they completely lost circadian rhythm. We not have completely lost circadian rhythm. So in the lab, when we actually feed them every day and there's still light they're in the same system, there's noise at the same time, and they may have light sensing through the pineal gland, they do get a circadian rhythm. So they will breed always at the same time, also at night, during the night. It's not as clean and clear cut as in surface fish. So surface breed basically right when the light goes off. For cave fish, it's more of a several hours window. So the circadian clock is not as clean as it is for surface fish. And indeed, if you look at expression differences, there is, there are basically still a lot of genes are, are cycling, but they are, the amplitude is changing. They're not as clean anymore. So they are kind of on the way of losing it because if you go into the cave, and tested there, there is no circadian rhythm. So people have done that, looked in the cave, there's no tight keeper, right? I mean, there's nothing. Um, so there they completely do not show it anymore, but if you then bring them back into the lab, then they will actually, they completely haven't lost it fully. So we definitely think that the clock is playing a major role in many of the things that we're showing um, here as well. Um, um, but we haven't, we have only explored it a little bit in the muscle, and we see it there as well. Um, we have explored it um, systemically in larvae, but we haven't looked, for example, in liver and all these other things as well. But yeah. Very cool. Thanks. Okay. Thanks for that. Great, great, great questions, Kaylin. Really appreciate it. Uh, we have a group, it looks like, uh, under the name of Melissa Bateson. Thank you for joining, Melissa. Um, I imagine it's one of you there who has a question. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you. And thanks for joining. Oh, we can't hear you. Maybe you're muted. Uh oh, we might have a technical problem. Do you want us to come back to you in just a minute? We're not hearing anything, Melissa Bateson. Let's come back to that, that group in just a minute. Uh, Cynthia, it looked like you had a question in the chat. Uh, would you like to ask that? And there was some follow-up as well from uh, Nia and some others. You're also muted. Cynthia, you're muted. Cynthia. <laughs> I was worried for a minute it, there. It, it's endemic. We are discussing <laughs> whether or not the cave 
fish, uh, whether the water became hypoxic mm -hmm. in between floods and if there were any adaptations to hypoxia. Yes. So again, hypoxia also very important, uh, playing most likely a very important role. So the the oxygen levels are about 60 to 80 percent um, um, dissolved oxygen in the water when we go there in the dry season, which is pretty low. Um, so it's really 100 percent in, in the rivers outside. Um, and so there's been some work showing that cavefish are adapted to hypoxia from other labs. Um, we have not done that ourselves, but we definitely think that some of these phenotypes, even some like you could imagine the, the glycogen phenotype could be related to the hypoxia adaptation. Um, so yes, the, I'm again, also very certain that hypoxia is playing a major role, but we haven't personally haven't um, um, worked on that, but would be cool. Okay. Interesting, yeah. Great, uh, thank you. Melissa Bateson at all, do you guys wanna try again or do you want us to just ask your question? <laughs> okay, I'm seeing somebody shake their head. Um, okay, the question is, uh, have you found any differences between the cave fish that experience constant low food compared to the ones that have more intermittent fasting? Mm -hmm. Yes, so for example, what we found is that the um, hyperphagia mutation, this uh, MC41 um, um, mutation, is only present in the caves that, are, that get floods. So Tinaja and Molino, they get flooded. Um, there we see this mutation in um, Pachon, which does not get flooded. There we do not see this mutation. Again, making sense because if you if you basically if you get food a lot to do a flood, then you want to be able to overeat. So then it makes sense to have this this hyperphagia mutation. But if you constantly have no food, then being hungry all the time must be, I mean, it's a disaster, right? So um, therefore it's it's much better to, to have it this. It still sucks for half of the year being hungry and not getting it, but at least it allows you to overeat when food is there. So, I mean, of course it's a lot of storytelling and evolution, right? So um, we don't know if that's really the case, but at least there is this nice correlation between having this um, um, hunger mutation and uh, or this overeating mutation and, 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 and the cave environment. Okay, great. Um, there was a question in the chat uh, from Lynette Sievert. Lynette, it's great to see you here. Are you still on? And would you like to ask your question? Oops. Yep, still here. Oh, excellent. Yeah, there I you was, are. Okay. Hi. <laughs> I was just interested whenever you talked about a lifespan of 15 years. That seems really long for a little fish. And so I was just wondering, is, are there other aspects of their aging that is slowed? You talked about diabetes, um, but are there other aspects that are slowed down with mm -hmm. aging? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, even the surface fish get 15 years old. Um, so, um, But I think that cave fish get even much, much older than that. So there's, for example, one cave fish. Um, it's called the Mexican cave cat, which a friend of mine in San Antonio has that. He has it in a bucket. And he has this in a bucket since 1990. So since more than 30 years. Um, and it's swimming around in this bucket. And he, he called me when he caught it, it was already this size. And he has other fish that are less than 20 years old and they are smaller than that. They're about 20 years old and they're about this uh, smaller than that. So this fish must have been already at least 20 years old when he got it, is now another 30 years. So we're talking 50 plus, I don't know, maybe 100, maybe 1,000 years. We have no idea. So they, they live very, very long. Um, generally, that seems to be the case for cave animals. And again, the idea is that brings me more to the intermittent fasting kind of thing, right? I mean, low metabolism, um, just slowing down metabolism allows you to kind of live longer also. Um, and so that is definitely something that is that is observed. But of course, it's hard to study with long lived animals. Right. So that's why we're going more to the cave, uh, to zebrafish system, and try to mimic some of the mutations in zebrafish or even in killifish. So we have a person in the institute who has killifish, which live only three, four, five months. So maybe we can do some of these experiments there if we find the genes that are responsible. At least we found the insulin receptor. I mean, that's it's not too surprising. There are other sh studies that show that if you if you decrease insulin receptor, um, if you mutate insulin receptor or decrease insulin signaling, you basically get longevity so we see the same thing but now we can maybe test some of the other genes that are playing a role but yes i think it has to do with the thriftiness and the lower metabolism rates and, and things like that and i mean of course 
that that's why you have selected it for right if the is the is the not having predators right mm -hmm. because what does it help you to live 50 or 100 years if you're in, in a river you're never going to make it 50 or 100 years um but in a cave yeah you could live that long right yeah. thank you okay we have so many questions coming in in the chat it's starting to get a little bit hard to keep track of everything uh sudindra i know that uh, you were willing to ask your question would you like to go ahead so thanks charles uh i was can you hear me yes perfect okay great i, I was i was just curious out of, out of desperation um one hears of cannibalism mm -hmm. uh, whenever you have a starved population anything like that going on there absolutely yeah so there's um in in fish um zebra fish if you if you or probably every fish if you um injure the the skin they release a, a substance which is called schreckstoff um got a german name um because all the other fish are basically swimming away from it um and it makes sense because okay fish got hurt so yeah you're probably going to go away from that area where, where that fish get get hurt in cave fish again only anecdotal we're not studying this but i heard it from from someone uh, anecdotally cave fish get attracted to the shrek stuff. Again, in a cave, it makes more sense, right? If someone's hurt, oh, maybe something to eat rather than uh, a predator. So um, again, makes sense, but we haven't followed up on this, but it would be interesting to study that. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks for that question, that perspective. Uh, Nia Holtz, would you like to ask your question? We'll do one more after this. And so I'll take one from the chat if uh, nobody else raises their hand. Go ahead, go ahead, Nia. Hi, I just wanted to ask if you knew of any um, immune differences or physiological changes associated to the advanced glycogen end products in the Molino population as compared to the other cave populations. So you mean if the surface fish get AGEs or problems with AGEs, if you put them on a high sugar diet, for example, or 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 do you want to... I mean so you you mentioned that Molino have higher ah uh, Molino yes okay yeah so like yeah so oh yeah that, for Molino yeah so we have not looked at Molino at all so we don't know um, um, I mean one question that's why I kind of misunderstood your question first so so one question that we wanted to study was first of all of course surface fish right do they even get surface fish do they even get um, um, AGEs, right? Maybe fish just don't get AGEs and that's that's the end of the story. But we actually put them on a high sugar diet or not high sugar, we actually put them in, in sugar water. Um, you swim, the fish swim in, in a sugar solution and that actually increases their blood sugar and also increases their AGEs. And so we are now studying how much that's affect, in, affecting the inflammation, but we do definitely see this in surface fish. Okay, fish are um, immune except the Molino, and we have we don't know why Molino. So that would be then the next step is then to study Molino, but we we haven't we haven't done that at all. Um, so we have no idea what, what what's going on with Molino. Uh, just to follow up with that real quick, uh, when you talk about inflammatory factors, which factors are you guys looking at specifically? Yeah, so in this case, we only looked at interleukin one beta and a few other interleukins um, um, as, as as markers. Um, and uh, in the fat, we looked for the the presence of these uh, crown-like structures, um, just visually in sections. Um, but that's pretty much so far the only factors that we looked at. Um, I mean, there would be more definitely better ways of, of quantifying uh, inflammation and we haven't we haven't explored that yet so that's one postdoc will start um, in January and uh, um, she will be really focusing on the inflammation aspect so I hope that I have a better answer um, uh, soon thank you I, I work on cave fish so it's great to hear about this oh great and okay thanks thanks for those questions and we'll take one more question ned if you're on would you like to ask your question ned pats otherwise i'm sure. happy to ask it yeah thanks so much uh it's fascinating to me as a i'm a cancer biologist and uh i always learn things from these and but it's often relative to cancer so do you see any differences in tumors in some of these different populations particularly given the change in metabolism and the immune system mm -hmm. yeah and given that um naked mole rats 
have adapted to hypoxia, live underground, are blind, and are kind of resistant to, to cancer to some extent, right? So, um, uh, but unfortunately, no, we have not. Um, so um, I have not found someone in my lab who wants to study that, but um, that is on the list of things that we want to do because um, it's very likely, or I mean, we don't know, but it, it's possible that we see some resistance to to cancer as well i mean just anecdotally we haven't seen tumors but we also haven't seen many tumors in surface fish so it's not yeah. like um, it's hard to to say um um we would really need to very carefully test this um by overexpressing some oncogenes or something like that um, but we have not we have not done that i mean we have a cell line we have now cell lines so i think that would be the easier way quickly to see if the cell lines show something um, but we haven't we haven't pursued that. Okay, thank you. Would be interesting, definitely. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna wrap up. We always try to wrap up before the hour. Uh, Nicholas, thank you so much for a fascinating talk. Uh, this is really an amazing system. It, as you can tell from all the the different questions uh, that it generated, really fascinating. Uh, thanks for sharing this work with us, Cynthia. Thank you for uh, doing the introductions. Becca, thank you for uh, organizing, keeping us on track. And everybody, it's great to see you. Thanks so much for tuning in uh, to this Club Med.